Presbyterian Church. We are glad you're here this morning. We got another beautiful God's Day out here. Yesterday was wonderful. If you didn't get a chance to enjoy the sunshine and the warm weather yesterday, you missed a great blessing, but you're going to have an opportunity, I think, today. So we're glad you're here to worship with us this morning. We're going to get started. We've got a, a packed service for you today of things, and hopefully I'll uh, get them all right. So anyway, if you want to stand this morning as we sing, you're welcome to. Uh, let's worship. Your faithfulness is walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. All over my life I see the promises in fulfillment All over my life All over my life Help me remember when I speak Fear may come but fear will leave Praise God this morning for worship. We're so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. And if you're worshiping with us online, we welcome you to the service as well. We hope to get you back in the sanctuary as soon as possible. We know that some of you cannot do that right now, and we hope God will bless you 
through the internet waves this morning as we send the service out to you this morning. Let this be your call to worship this morning. The new life of resurrection is not something we patiently wait for in another life or some abstract future, but is to be seen right here, right now. The path to transformation is discipleship and each prayer, each moment of study, each relationship we foster, and every act of service is a step on that path. Let this act of worship become a step forward in your life, and may we grow in the faith with one another through God's grace. Amen. This morning, as we continue to worship in song, I'd like to welcome Pastor McGinnis this morning, all the way from northeast, I guess, of here, southeast, southeast, not northeast. All right. Down, down, down. I'm thinking up, Rodney. I'm thinking up. Sorry. We're glad to have you and your family here today. Amen. And we're happy to have my son on the drums this morning. We have a drum set this morning in use. And his lovely bride, my daughter-in-law. What is your name? Stephanie. And my grandson's out there too. So that's Theo. All right. How many of you ever felt like this? There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears a burden Where another died for me There is another in Fire. All my dead left for dead beneath the water. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the water. And should I ever need reminding how I've been set free? There is a place that holds no body. name that is Jesus. 
He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. should commend the team for working their way through what I did with that song this morning. <laughs> Amen. All right. Now they laugh. They're thinking, what is he doing? That's why they call it a team. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.
a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and your children may labor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and your children may it forever go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 doesn't get you fired up, I don't know what will. Amen? Amen. 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 This morning, I want to start off with a morning prayer. Bow with me if you would. Loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your mercy and grace of all, all of which we all need all of the time. We thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you for the relief that we're getting from COVID. We thank you for the relief that we're getting from pain and suffering and death associated with it. We thank you for what the spring brings with the sunshine and the warm air and this feeling of blossoms blooming and great smells in the air. We just thank you for where we are and who you are. Be with us through the remainder of this service. Let us lift everything up to you in praise, for it's all in your glory and name. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we're going to recite the Apostles' Creed. If you would stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence we shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. 
This morning, as we enter a time of confession, let us enter with humble hearts and hear these words. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We've not loved our neighbor as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Let's pray together silently this morning. And let this be your assurance of forgiveness. In Christ, we come face to face with the full character of God, whose judgment on humanity is love, whose life calls us to new life, and whose very being is our refuge. Know that you are forgiven, freed, and loved. Amen. You may be seated. We'll enjoy special music this morning from some of our choir members.
Isn't it great to have the choir back? Amen. Amen. First, we've had some of the choir members over the last few weeks, but it's uh, but, uh, so nice to get back into the swing of things. Hope you're well this morning. Everybody doing good? Yeah. All right. Glad to be in God's house. Yes. Amen. All right. This morning, this morning, we're going to talk about the title of the message is called, Do You Love Me? And I want to pray before we start. I don't typically do that right at the beginning, but I want to do that because it's kind of a packed message, and I'm going to do something a little different this morning than I've done in the past. So pray with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I just lift you up this morning. I just ask that your words be mine. Give me the heart of your disciple this morning, for it's in your name I pray. Amen. Since Easter Sunday, we've been working our way forward from the resurrection and what happened next. After Jesus' resurrection, we encountered Mary Magdalene, if you remember. She had a personal account with Jesus, encounter with Jesus. And when she recognized him, upon the sound of her name, Mary. We followed the travelers on the road to Emmaus. That led them to an encounter with Jesus himself and how he brought them back to the understanding that not only had he risen, but he began to open their eyes to witness, to the witness and proclamation of Scripture. And its importance to in the believer's life and the believer's future relationship with him. We then went to the upper room where we encountered Thomas and his need for Jesus to prove that he was who he said he was. And Jesus showed him his wounds. He let him touch the holes left by the nails. Today, we follow six disciples as they encounter Jesus again. In fact, for the third time since he's the risen Savior. And right behind our recollection of Thomas, we have the story now of Peter, another character in the Gospel of John. Sometimes, if not often, misinterpreted, perhaps. Perhaps Peter's story is not as misinterpreted as Thomas, but perhaps it's time we freed Peter from his own chains of misunderstanding. Thomas the doubter and Peter the denier. Peter, if you remember, he's the go-to guy, the one who can usually be counted on when things need to get done in the impulsive way that Peter always got things done. He's the guy who requested a full body bath from Jesus at the foot washing to heading out in the garden and then slicing the ear of Malik. Today, he's getting dressed. He's jumping into the sea to get to Jesus. And this is the behavior we've come to expect from Peter. The 21st chapter of John, is, based on my study, may offer some differences of opinion within the theological community as to its authorship. It would appear that most early, believed to be reliable manuscripts, would mostly agree that John wrote it. Given its attachment to the first 20 chapters and the commonality of language used, I'm not sure it makes a great difference whether John actually wrote the 21st chapter or if it was somehow inspired to a scribe to give, who was given the task. Either way, I believe, as I know you do, it was inspired by God and it has its rightful place in the Bible, most likely authored by John himself. So today, I'm going to share the message in a different way. As I would like to reference the Scripture passage, if you all want to turn there, it's John 21, verses 1 through 23. 
John 21, verses 1 through 23. But I would like to use a paraphrased novel version of this story, which I find similarly accurate and beautifully portrayed. This novel was written by Walter Wangren, Jr., who is widely recognized as one of the most gifted writers writing today on the issues of faith and spirituality. Please reference the scripture passage itself, but I'd like to share it this morning in this way because I'd like to put you into the shoes and the mindset of Peter this morning. I really want you to take a few minutes this morning and clear your mind and really feel what Peter was going through. It's my Peter attire. This is Peter speaking. I let my beard grow back. First few days I was too sad to share. I didn't think about it, but then the Lord Jesus rose from the dead just exactly as he said he would. Exactly, you see, as he said, which is exactly part of the problem. Because I I never really paid any attention to that saying because I didn't believe he would die. So how could I even consider that he would come back to life again? But he did. Exactly as he said he would. He rose up from the dead and he appeared in person before us and I was astonished. I was speechless. I was so glad for him and I was so overjoyed for the whole world. But yet at the same time, I was sick inside myself. I can't describe this. It's impossible. Nothing is greater than this. God is here. God is in Jesus. The kingdom of God begins in Jesus. And as much as I know that, as much as I love and I believe it, that's how much I hate myself. That's how horrible I feel because I'll never enter that kingdom. I don't deserve it. I gave up my right. I denied my Lord and I rejected him to save myself. Now, mind you, as this is happening, after Peter has seen Jesus already, I think we all know what it feels like when we've messed up this badly. This is the type of messed up that penetrates your soul. Seems to be a pretty good description of how you or I might feel if we'd been in the same circumstance as Peter. I rejected him to save myself. Do you understand this? It's at these times of crisis when the truth comes out. I'm the one who swore he didn't know Jesus. So after those first days, I let my beard grow long on purpose. It would be hypocrisy to believe that I could be like my Lord anymore. Mary Magdalene said we should go to Galilee. Mary Salome and Joanna agreed, and they said that an angel had told them that Jesus would meet us there, so we went. By the time we got to Capernaum, I couldn't stand it anymore. I had to do something, something I could throw my body into, something familiar so that I wouldn't have to think. You ever done that before? Have you ever immersed yourself in a diversion away from your problems at hand? When the going gets tough, when we're in deep, when we retreat into something familiar, a place for refuge so that we're distracted by reality, sometimes you just put on the TV for a while for white noise, or perhaps you watch a really crazy movie, nothing intellectual about it, just something you can get lost in. Others pour themselves into their work, or perhaps they get immersed in a hobby. Maybe you chop a load of firewood, even though you don't have a fireplace or a wood stove. Maybe you shop till you drop, until you're broke, just to get your mind off your troubles. 
Some people binge clean. You come home, uh, you come home and, and from work and you see that every cleaning product known to man is on the counter and you say, what's wrong? Something must have happened. Something, we just feel the need to get off our mind of the reality of what's going on around us. So I said, I'm going fishing. And I ran away from the rest of them just as I was shoving off. Here came a group of disciples, not a thought in their head except to follow my lead. Remember, Peter's the go-to guy. He's the leader. So when the leader is in the middle of a moral failure, it's even more devastating. It has an impact on those who follow him. Just like leaders in the church, we make mistakes. We don't always get it right. Sometimes we fail, and when we do, the burden is great. There's a feeling that we let down our friends, our fellow congregates, our families, and perhaps God himself. The opportunity to lead is an amazing honor, but at the same time comes with a heavy weight and burden. That night, stars were like sands on the seashore. The black sky was swollen with stars. I was grateful for the darkness and for the work. It didn't bother me that we caught nothing. And suddenly someone said, who's that? And we looked over our shoulders, and there was a man standing on the beach, his tunic like a flame in the sunrise light. Hey, children, have you caught anything? No. Well, then cast your nets on the right side and see what you catch. Two factoids. I like that word, factoids. Fishing in the Sea of Galilee was most likely better at night. And throwing one net on a single side of the boat would typically result in nothing. It's not the way they fished. The net sank for a moment, likely in shallow waters, and then it came to life. The water was boiling and churning with fish. Simon, John was calling. All four of us were straining just to bring the nets near the gunwales. Simon, it's Jesus that's on the shore. And the word went through me like a sword, a sweet yet terrible pain. I couldn't hold still. I lashed my net to the gunwale, and I tied my work clothes around my waist, and I threw myself into the sea, and I swam toward shore as fast as I could. Stupid, stupid. It's how we talk to ourselves, isn't it? When we get down, when we get down on ourselves, we're so down on ourselves because of our bad decisions. When I came out of the water, I couldn't think of anything to say. Stupid, stupid. Why did I come to this shore by myself? I stood there feeling wretched. And Jesus had kindled a charcoal fire, breaded fish. We've already laid on it breakfast for one he didn't look at me. He looked to the boat and still struggling to get shoreward. So there were those who belonged to him who were working and worthy. And here I was idle and unworthy. And as they came close, I waded back into the water to help drag the nets onto dry land. We spread out a wide carpet of glittering fish. And Jesus said, bring me some fish and come have breakfast with me. We sat, and Jesus sat among us, and he served us one after the other, but I couldn't eat. Neither was he eating. He kept looking at me. Oh, those eyes, dead level and gleaming. He would not stop looking at me. I wanted to crawl away, and I would have, but he opened his mouth, and he spoke to me. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? We don't know for sure what 
these meant? Did it mean more than the other disciples loved him? Did the disciples love Jesus more? It's not certain. Yes, Lord, I think I shouted the answer. It came immediately, all on its own. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But Jesus never smiled nor blinked. Solemnly, he said, feed my lambs. Did he mean it? Was he he granting me a place with him? I, I held that notion very tenderly and not quite certain, but still He did not stop staring at me. Have you ever been in that place in your life when you wondered if Jesus still loved you after the things that you've done? Could it be true that Jesus loves me, you might ask? Can I be forgiven, you might ask? That he wants me to help feed his lambs. And then he spoke again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Carefully, because I meant it, and I wanted him to believe that I meant it, and I said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep. But even then, this wasn't over. He kept looking over at me, and now I knew what was coming. And it did come for the third time. He said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I bowed my head. I started crying like a child. He was asking me a question, but he was also telling me something, too. He knew how many times I said I didn't even know him. He knew I couldn't raise my face to him. I said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. There was a great silence after that. There was some moving around, but no one said anything. But I left his hand. I I, I felt felt his hand on my shoulder. Jesus was kneeling now in front of me. And he took a crooked finger under my chin so I'd look up at him. And I looked through my tears and I saw his eyes. It was filled with such kindness that I only cried harder. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Yes, Jesus was offering me a place in the kingdom to be a shepherd of my flock. Yes, Lord, yes. And then he goes on to tell Peter that when you were a young man, you used to fasten your belt and go where you wanted to go. And when you grow old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you don't want to go. Do you understand His expression was ancient and earnest and filled with meaning. You understand that I'm telling you that the sort of death you will die by which you will glorify God. Now we know Peter was indeed a martyr for the faith. He was crucified upside down, it's told, because he was undeserving to be crucified in the way that his Savior was crucified. I nodded. I understood. So then Jesus stood up and he said to me all over again what he had said to me at the very beginning of our relationship. He said, follow me. Follow me. What meaning? How about us today? Now what? Where do we go from here? This isn't a story that to prove that Jesus rose from the dead. I believe this chapter is written to the church. It's addressed to Peter, who will be gifted the right to lead the church. It addresses the rest of the disciples and even us today in 2021. 
As a church, we can't fulfill the mission before the church unless we allow ourselves to repent and to be forgiven. We as a church, just like Peter, must believe that God wants to heal us, that God wants to forgive us, that God wants to love us into serving and caring for his sheep. God can and will restore the best or the worst in us. His powers are limitless and his mercy boundless. I'm sure you've done things you're not proud of. God has seen us at our very best and our very worst. Peter was holding on to his own guilt. But Jesus had already forgiven him. But what he was telling Peter, and what I believe he's instructing his churches today in 2021, is that we cannot allow our past mistakes to be an excuse. We cannot go on saying or believing that Jesus could and would never use us because Jesus is calling us out just like he did Peter. It's interesting that Jesus used the charcoal fire and he asked Peter three times if he loved him. Sound faintly familiar? The other time that charcoal and fire are mentioned together in the Bible that I'm aware of was when Peter betrayed Jesus three times. Peter had such self-pity, such shame. Peter needed to accept Jesus' forgiveness. And just like Peter, no matter what we've done, no matter how many times we failed, if we're truly sorry, if we're truly ready to trust him, truly ready to commit to him, get ready for what's coming. Do you love me? Go feed my sheep. Jesus was bringing Peter back full circle. He was taking him from his sin and offering him shelter by accepting forgiveness and agreeing to get on with the task at hand. This was mercy. This was grace. Interesting that nowhere in the story does Jesus say the words, I forgive you. Because I believe that Peter hasn't done anything deserving of Jesus' forgiveness at that point. No, the person who needed to forgive Peter was Peter. Oftentimes, we fall back on our need to fix relationships. And in this case, Peter's desire to mend his relationship with Christ But as we dig into the scripture a bit further, we see that what Peter needs to accept is who Jesus needs him to be. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, known as the Synoptic Gospels, the question Peter is asked is this, do you know the man? Peter then responds, I don't know the man. And in John, we find the question of Peter is, aren't you one of his disciples? To which Peter responds, I am not. And this is why in John's gospel that Jesus is asking for Peter's repentance. Instead, he's only asked, do you love me? Perhaps Jesus is reaffirming who Peter needs to be, the disciple he needs Peter to be. You know, denying our identity is an all too common theme. We deny who we are because we worry that we won't meet everyone's expectations. We deny who we are because we're afraid we'll disappoint people. We deny who we are because we might be judged and even rejected. We deny who we are because we do not believe that we will be liked or accepted for who we truly are and that we will be loved for who we are. Get on with it. Do you love me? to serve me, go spread the good news to others for me, go forth and heal broken hearts and forgive others, feed my sheep. Let's put this behind us, Peter. I believe you love me. Now go feed my sheep. Like Peter, all of us want to go back fishing at some point in our life. When it happens, remember that God who called you is faithful. Failure cannot disqualify you in his eyes. 
Continue to serve him even when you feel like everything is over because failure can't kill the edge God has given you. And so Jesus shows up on the shore. He hosts a meal one more time and he tells Peter, he tells us, I believe in you. I know who you are and I love you. And yes, you are exactly the disciple I need, the disciple the world needs for God to the world. I ask you this. If Jesus was here today and he asked you, do you love me? What would your answer be? Will you feed my sheep? Are you the disciple he needs? Is there service he is calling you to today? Are you struggling with forgiving yourself and accepting Jesus calling out to you? Peter had come to terms, had to come to terms with the past that haunted him, but when he did, he was able to accept God's acknowledgement only by God's extension of grace to us all so that he could go forward and serve him. No matter what you're walking around with today, there is a God that loves you, is willing to forgive whatever mistakes or horrible life choices you think you've made. Peter denied that he knew Jesus to save himself essentially from death. If he was able to take Peter from that very dark place to leadership in his church, can you imagine what God may have in store for you? Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your words In John, and I thank you, Lord, for Peter's witness and his testimony to all of us. We know that you call us out. You call us to acknowledge that there is work to be done. Help us to be the person or the person that you would have us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare this morning for communion together, if you're worshiping with us from home, gather your uh, communion supplies together, your elements that you may have, some juice and some crackers or bread that you might have. That will suffice if you have that at home. I want to remind us why we partake of the Lord's Supper Preparation to receive this sacrament involves careful examination of the condition of our life in Christ, of our sins and our failings, of whether we truly and to what degree know God and believe in Him and have repented, and of whether we love God and our fellow believers. We're called to be charitable and have a charitable attitude toward everyone, including forgiveness of those who have wronged us. We also must assess how much we desire Christ and whether we're living in newness of of obedience. And finally, we must renew the practice of these graces in us through meditation and prayer. And if this is where you are this morning, this table is open to you and you are welcome. Presbyterians, along with other Protestant denominations, believe there's no compositional change in the elements when consumed. Rather, the common elements of bread and wine represent the body and blood of Christ who is present spiritually in this sacrament. And so those who receive the Lord's Supper in the right way do actually feed on the body and blood of Christ. Not in a bodily or physical way, but spiritually while by faith they receive and apply to themselves Christ.
Christ crucified along with all the benefits of his death. Therefore, as I prepare the juice and the bread, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that these elements be used to sanctify your body and your blood. Help them to be used for this purpose and not for common use. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body for which if, this is my body which if for you do in remembrance of me, let us partake of the bread together. And in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now take the cup and drink all of it. Let us join together this morning. As we say the Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power forever. Amen. This is a time when we normally acknowledge our, our tithes and our offering. Uh, we still have the offering plates in the narthex, and you're welcome to send those in or go on the website if, you, if it's easier for you to do it electronically. We just welcome you to take the opportunity of giving, which is an act of worship that we're not made to do, but we're allowed to do in Christ's name. Let's pray for our tithes and offerings this morning. Heavenly Father, we pray for the tithes and offerings that will be received here today. We thank you for their use and for their purpose, and we just pray that you uplift us, that you give us the wisdom to utilize these gifts to glorify your kingdom, to build up this church, to build up our community, to bring others to Christ. Bless this now and bless the givers as they, as they give and bless the gifts to your use. In Christ's name we pray, amen. This morning, uh, as we consider our prayer concerns, I uh, want to continue to be in prayer for uh, the Betty Harvey family. We had a, a funeral service yesterday out at Calvary Cemetery. Uh, there were about 60 people there. It was a beautiful day. Um, and uh, they had a big family, uh, and uh, I know um, Donna and Marilyn, uh, we certainly want to be with you as well because there's someone missing in your pew, uh, and we miss her as well. Uh, the uh, family came downstairs for a, a luncheon yesterday. We had about 50 people who served, so our committee that took care of all that, thank you so much for that, that ministry uh, for the family yesterday. Continue to be uh, in prayer for uh, Reverend Bruce Rice, uh, who, uh, who, as I reported last week, uh, had some poor findings uh, of pancreatic cancer. And um, 
I don't know any additional details about that, but I know he's in the process of, of, of figuring that all out with his healthcare providers. For Sue Atterbury, I would ask you to continue to be in prayer for her and for Richard. For Nick Schilt, for Polly Smith, for Garrett Smith, for Gail Canavan. For our confirmation class completers last week, don't forget about that. I know it happened a week ago, but we need to be in prayer for these young people. It's a marvelous thing to see young people begin their faith walk. Pray for them. Mentor them. Be there for them and their families. Let's don't forget them. For others that I haven't mentioned this morning, I pray that we lift them up as well. So pray with me, if you would, as I lift these names up this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just continue to pray for these families that have lost loved ones. We pray for our, our beloved friend and, and, and pastor, Bruce Rice. We just pray that you, we lift him up today to you to, um, to heal his, his body and his spirit, Lord. We pray that they will find a way to, to continue to treat him. For Sue Atterbury, for Nick Schilt, for Polly Smith, for Garrett, for Gail Canavan, for others in our midst that we continue to pray for who are homebound and unable to be at our services because of health or because of COVID or, or someone taking care of someone else, we just pray that we continue to lift those folks up this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you touch them, that you heal what needs to be healed, that you comfort what needs to be comforted, but mostly let them know that you're there, that you're there with them all the way, no matter what, until the end. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beautiful day today. It's been a good day in God's house. Thank you for being here. If you're worshiping online this morning, we hope to see you back in, in the sanctuary very soon. If you would stand this morning, let this be your benediction. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.